These are on opposite sides of the, the Brexit debate. Steve Baker, former Brexit minister, deputy chairman of the ERG group of MPs who want to leave the EU, and Nick Bowles, former business minister uh, who campaigned to remain in the EU. Um, Steve Baker, you really shot yourselves in the foot yesterday, didn't you? No, of course, that's not how we see it. But what I think I have to say is we were all really yearning to be able to vote for this deal. Remember, all but three colleagues voted for the Brady Amendment. We did that because that underpinned Malthouse Compromise Plan A. Let's, can we and not as, avoid as, the Malthouse as, as Compromises late, and things because well, people don't understand it? <clears throat> well, I'm glad to come on to it for as long as you like. But uh, on... Um, as, as late as 10 a.m. yesterday, we were wrestling, was what Geoffrey Cox had achieved, what the government had achieved, good enough? Could we vote for the deal, particularly in the context of the unilateral statement? But then what happened, two things happened. We got some first sight of our own lawyer's advice, and then we got Geoffrey Cox's advice. And in the end, you know, that final paragraph of his advice showing that uh, we would not have a lawful mechanism to exit the backstop, um, you know, that really blew up all prospect of us being able to vote for the deal. And it, it, this is not the situation we wanted to be in, but at that point, um, everybody had to take a decision um, on what they thought was the least worst thing to do. But um, I have to tell you that uh, until that legal advice from both camps was available to us, we were still yearning to find a way to vote for the deal. And what do you want to happen now? Well, what we've done is Damien Green has put the lead, his lead name to it. Ian Duncan Smith, Nicky Morgan, myself, Jacob, Simon Hart from the Brexit Delivery Group and Nigel Dodds. We've tabled an amendment related to the Malthouse B compromise. So, of course, so what does that mean? What that means is you throw three safety nets around exiting without a withdrawal agreement. Very simply, the first is that you continue to offer Plan A, which is that if we had alternative arrangements on the Irish backstop, we would approve the withdrawal agreement. That is the first thing. The second is that we would offer to buy the implementation period for basically the financial settlement in the withdrawal agreement. So they get about £10 billion a year and we all get a transition arrangement, the negotiated IP. That's a big ask for Eurosceptics. And the third is that we take advantage of a, a wide range of standstill agree agreements, arrangements, unilateral, often unilateral and reciprocal arrangements that have been put in place by the European Union. So and, that is, those and, are the things... And, and you notify it under GATT 24, you not just notify, rather, you, you negotiate and agree that we're going to have a standstill and notify that trade preference to the WTO. And yeah. that provides a, a third way that you can exit smoothly. So we've tabled an amendment which is part of the Malthouse Compromise Plan B. We've got a range of people from Wings of the Party plus Nigel Dodds. I'd encourage Labour MPs to sign it. We think this is a way through and um, we would very much like the, the Parliament to unite around Malthouse B. And in theory, in theory, if that were to happen, it could be done within the time frame. We would be able to lose to, to, to leave on March 29th. Is that what you're saying? Well, what we've what we've done is uh, the second. You'd have to go back to Brussels, wouldn't you? Well, the <laughs> it's a small point, but um, rather well, an important well, one. Indeed, but look, everybody, everybody, with what, with the exception of one member of Parliament, who, who is well known, I think everybody else would very much like to reach an agreement. What we've said in this amendment, which you've had to think carefully about, is that the Prime Minister should seek an extension of Article 50 to 10:59 on the on May the 20. Uh, I think. 22nd we've put down and this the point here is to make sure that we don't end up participating in the European elections but businesses do get some more time to prepare so we're trying to be eminently reasonable it's compromise for everybody um, but we are in the business of finding a way to unite all wings of the party in the DUP so that the government can be stable and we can exit. This is the point, isn't it, that uh, Michel Barnier did, uh, as, as Nick Bowles just said, tweeted last night, there seems to be, a, and his quote was, a dangerous illusion that the UK can benefit from a transition in the absence of the WBA, uh, of the WA. Let me be clear, the only legal basis for a transition is the withdrawal agreement. And, and, and that is the case, isn't it, Steve Baker? Well, we're happy to say to him, under the Malthouse Compromise, that we'd go back and say, you can have Plan A, which is if we change the backstop for alternative arrangements, which, you know, the feasibility of which has basically been accepted now, there is a work stream to do it, that if you change... If you change the backstop for alternative arrangements, we can agree the withdrawal agreement. And That's he'll a say very no because he's made that perfectly clear. Well, negotiability, I'm afraid, is a dynamic concept, and if you consistently throw away your negotiating leverage, for example, by breaching the ministerial code in order to force no deal off the table, which did have a, a significant effect on the negotiations, if you make catastrophic mistakes like that in your negotiations, if you announce your tariff schedules when it's really too late to influence the negotiations and don't do it in a smart way by, for example, opening up your quotas to the world on beef and dairy, which would have increased 
uh, are leverage. If you don't do sensible things to increase your leverage and then you try to negotiate, having taken all your power off the table, well, of course you get a bad result. And, but uh, what I would say is David Campbell Bannerman has set out in some detail in a Telegraph article online how he's been voting on unilateral but reciprocal, things which are expected to be reciprocal measures to ensure that contingencies are in place in the event of a no-deal exit. And indeed the German spokesman who was on earlier talked about that. You had the President and Port of Calais on and his main concern was that we shouldn't damage their reputation by suggesting they wouldn't be ready. So the reality is if we actually, if the government at last decided to advertise the, the extent of preparations on both sides and to complete them so that we exited into a standstill at least until, until Christmas, then members of Parliament and the public could have confidence that a minimum of disruption would happen as we exited the EU. It is possible to do it. David Campbell-Bannerman set out how. 